Actor Mel Gibson, director George Miller. Beyond Thunderdome, you've been together long enough now in the movie making process. Could we trade some descriptions? Mel, could you talk about George, George? his special talents as a director, and then let's reverse the process. All right. He's not really a very nice man at all. <laughs> his strengths as a director, I think, lie in a... He's a director, but he's, I think, firstly, I think he's a filmmaker. Um, he's been very innovative with his style of filmmaking, I think. He uses uh, a theme that perhaps has been used before, the hero theme, the Western or whatever, and applies his particular talent to it, which is... Uh, his technique in film, I, he, he's got an originality that I don't think has been seen in certain other films. I'm intrigued by the soft-spoken nature of the guy as opposed to the kinetic impact of the picture. Look, he's tough. Huh? Be, uh, he is tough. Look, some very adverse conditions on this particular film and the others, but at the, one day I thought he was being really cruel. I thought, how can he be so callous? It's not callousness, it's just that his mind is so directed upon what he is doing that you could practically drive nails through his feet and he wouldn't... <laughs> no, I'm serious, he wouldn't feel it. Concentration. Yeah, that's a great strength as a director, I think. George, your turn. Manic. Uh, Mel? Manic. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is so strange to talk it about you and these sort of things. But, uh, Go on, Mel? be charming. Okay. <laughs> Mel, Mel, first of all, is a true actor, right? And that, he's not a personality in a sense that the acting comes first. He's a classically, classically trained actor from a very fine drama school. And sick, and to be an actor, basically it's an intuitive talent like an athlete. I mean, actors are really like athletes. They have the innate talent and then an enormous amount of hard work and technique to be able to do it. And I mean, Mel kids around a lot, but it really he's incredibly serious with his acting. And, um, and those two things, to be able to really want to just keep on improving your, your talent and the innate ability that you have is, is, is basically what you've got. The only difference, I think, working with you on this, this one is having done a lot of films, and particularly those that you've done in America, you're much more technically... I mean, you were. Oh, well, you you yeah. picked up on it very quickly on Mad Max 1, but I wasn't aware then, as a director, all that stuff the actor had to do. But uh, you're very technically aware to the extent that, after a while, George Ogilvy and I and Terry Hayes, the writer, <laughs> were often looking to Mel for advice on stuff like that, oh, because right. well, it is because then after I'd say something, I'd say shut up and go back to your thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not it, be, be, because if you, a, an actor, particularly one who spends a lot of time on the stage, is going to understand the audience rhythm better than someone who doesn't have that experience as much, because mm. you know there's a screaming panic with an actor on the stage saying, you know, I've got to do this right. I'm here yeah. now. <laughs> now yeah. I guess I can assume that there was no question that it would be Mel in the role, but Mel as the third time around for Max. Were there ever any hesitations initially, at least? Initially, sure. I mean, you, you want to know what's the story. You want to know what is happening with this film. And, uh, but I, I was pretty uh, willing to go along because I know that the, this, this particular mob, Kennedy Miller, Mr. Miller here, here he is, <laughs> were uh, um, their major concern in making a film is not to do a repeat, it's to actually go for something that's a progression on the last one and better, a better story. So George, how did you break the news to Mel that he was going to have to be in harness in more ways than one as an actor? I'm thinking now of the duel in yeah. Thunderdome. How do you break the news to an actor about such a grueling sequence? Well, it sort of happened slowly. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the, we, the stuff was designed, it's fairly elaborate, those big thick rubber bands were very, very elaborate. The stunt guys were working them up. And I, th I guess what happened is that Mel came to the, to the location and actually sat in one of those things. And it's, you know, it's very physically demanding because your body is a little bit like floating in space or something. I, don't I know. think it'd be fun at first. At first, yeah. At first. But it, was very, it was a very sort of attractive thing to do. But what happened, we, there wasn't any intention for Mel to do all the stunts in that sequence. But we found that he was better than the stunt guys. who were, the, he, he moved better. And uh, even though they were very good stunt doubles, uh, we found we were always cutting, tended to cut the footage that Mel did, so we kept on asking him to do more. By the time he'd done it all, it was over, so he was there. Uh, Mel, you had to use some compressed air boosters to get more lift, is that right? Air jacks, air lifts, what? yeah. What's that? Well, it's like it compresses the air to pull a steel cable over a pulley, and uh, the rubbers attached to the harness, steel plates at the hips, harness steel cable attached to the rubbers up above, over a pulley toward the... Oh, it's hard to Why? explain. 
uh, when they, it was a three to one ratio, when they'd lift the air jack three feet, you went for a nine foot fly. If they did six feet, you went 18 feet. So it was, you were in the hands of a kind of guy in his timing with a button, which requires some yeah. amount of trust. And <laughs> without revealing too much, you're a kind of a reluctant messiah figure here. And uh, even in your costume, uh, the, the hard outlines of the leather give way to a more flowing robe like, you're like a priest in a desert in a way. Did that appeal to you, this sort of dimension? It does. I mean, it's, it's a mythological hero yeah. time. And I mean, that's kind of linked in a way to beliefs or uh, religion, I suppose. Uh, and it's no substitute. This kind of sure. stuff goes in the business. Mark Rydell on the river said it was like, you can sit back and say, bring on the flood. Something very yeah. biblical yeah, about right. this kind yeah. of business. George? Stop the water. Yes. <laughs> Rain. George, what about that? There must have been some scenes where with the gesture, suddenly all hell breaks loose, literally. Yeah. Well, it, does it, this go to your head ever? It, it, it does. Uh, this uh, will be the uh, only trouble is it always happens at the wrong time. I mean, we're doing a, some scenes in a, in a sand dune where we wanted just a little bit of wind. And the day that it happened, a huge gale came up. And I foolishly tried to shoot the, the, the more subtle scenes in that. And uh, it was so, the wind was so strong that it, the sand would l literally sting your face. And luckily I had a, a very wise cameraman. He said, look, go with the flow. Let's, let's just do the shots where, where, where he, you know, get, let's get Max up and get Mel up. And Mel was prepared to do it, to walk through this stuff <laughs> endlessly. <laughs> and we were all covered and, and stuff like that. And we got those shots. But um, yeah, you sort of, yeah, if you think back on it, it, it gets a bit ridiculous. The sort of, you know, you say action and then suddenly all hell breaks, bro breaks loose. But when you're doing it, you don't have the, any sense of that p power. Well, did you hear yeah. what Mel just said? Cecil B. DeMiller. Yes. That's nice. No, no, that's Not okay. bad. <laughs> Mel, in yeah. the meantime, I suppose, is a change of pace or maybe it's a first love of yours. More intimate roles. I and mean, this is a soulful kind of thing. Mm. Death of a salesman you've done on stage. Yeah. Were, 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 you, were you Biff? Yes, I was, yeah. Well, uh, I find that mind-boggling. I'd love to hear more about those kinds of roles in your career. Well, I get an enormous amount of pleasure from doing those things. Um, Mrs. Soffel, I think, was something that I did. I think it did crummy at the box office. But I, I really enjoyed doing being that man in that film. I think he was... Um, I, I was able to stretch my technique in that a little more than, than previous. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of... I got a kick out of it. Yeah, and Sissy Spacek in the river told me that you worked real hard on that Tennessee dialect. Oh, geez, good, yeah. good, good job. <laughs> the vocal training of an artist. We don't hear that much about that kind of thing. Well, it's... Um, um, you have to... It's kind of like listening to music, I guess. You have to just listen to it again and again till you can hum it. But... Um, yeah, I think you have to put... See, if you're going to go with an accent, for instance, you have to be totally there or make some kind of compromise that doesn't do it but suggests it. You can go one or two ways, but I, I choose to go for the whole piece. I think you've got to do it all the way if you can. Maybe just, you have to hear... Maybe a Tennessee person doesn't think I sounded like one, but... Geez, I thought I did. <laughs> Together again for the third time, you guys are touching all the bases, and to echo one of the lines in the movie, keep on tracking. Yeah, for right. Keep on tracking. Some great filmmaking. Talking about Beyond Thunderdome with George Miller, of course, and Mel Gibson, and from Los Angeles for KCTV5, I'm John Tibbetts.